I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab a Bible or a Bible app and turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke 16 is our text. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1041. If you're joining us from our Parker campus, there's a table in the back. Uh, you can just get up right now and go grab one of those Bibles and turn to page 1041, and you can follow along in the text. And as always, if you're at any of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Bible and read the Bible. If you're joining us online uh, and you don't have a Bible and you want one, let us know. Message us and we will get you a Bible, whether we mail one to you or deliver it to you. We want everyone to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, just a couple of things. First thing I want to tell you is I literally just got back from my trip to Africa like five hours ago. And, uh, and so it is a joy to be here in my favorite church in the world. And, uh, and, and it's really nice to be worshiping with air conditioning. So uh, I will say that. I am a wimp. Uh, but, uh, uh, but anyway, had a great trip. Spent most of the time working with missionaries and pastors of... Uh, national leaders of five African nations in, in Central Africa, but uh, got to visit Mozambique and see some of the wells that you guys have uh, sponsored and put in. At, we're approaching 90 wells, about 65,000 plus people. Here's some pictures of July 30th. These are wells that were done this summer, just in the last couple of months. Uh, and some of the people, people were so excited that uh, they got to say thank you to Calvary by th say, thanking me that they actually gave me a chicken. <laughs> and, and I'm not going to lie, uh, I had to like hold the live chicken. I, I don't have practice doing that. And so I went to go, like, take the chicken, and it went, Wah! and I just jumped back. <laughs> All the Africans were cracking up at me, uh, so, because I jumped like a little girl. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it was not my best moment, but uh, I didn't care. So uh, anyway, it is wonderful to be home with you, and uh, I praise God for the, the difference that you are making in the lives of people where these wells go they are planting churches they are leading people to christ uh and we're seeing uh, god make a tremendous difference because of your generosity and then uh, i just got to also remind you again next weekend is chet and claudia's last weekend on staff at calvary they are moving to georgia he's going to go take care of his mom he always said he would when his stepdad passed away and so he's he's following through on his commitment to honor his father and his mother and uh, living up to it. And you guys all know Chet is a man of his word. And uh, he told her that probably 10 years ago. And so he's going to follow through on that. He's grieving leaving us. Next Sunday is going to be special at 8 o'clock classic service over at our McCulloch campus. Chet and I are going to be preaching together. Uh, and then at 4 o'clock in the afternoon at McCulloch, we're going to be having uh, uh, just a reception, a drop-in, and uh, say goodbye. Let him know if he has blessed you. Whether you're there or not, write him a note, send him a card. Uh, just flood him with your thoughts, wishes, and prayers. Uh, look, Calvary's going to bless him, but if you want to bless him in addition to that, that's up to you. But I'm just uh, grateful that he's been here for 18 years and uh, grieve seeing him go. But I'm also rejoicing in the fact that he is following God's leading in what he is doing. So, uh, so it's going to be a big weekend, uh, joyful and sorrowful all at the same time. Hey, what does it take to get your attention? I mean, for me, it was a chicken being given to me live, but I mean, what does it take to get your attention? Is it money, the possibility of making money or getting money? Is it an attractive person walking by? If so, you might need to repent. Uh, is it free food? All right, who, who loves free food? Okay, say, I, okay, get your attention. Uh, big events, is it a football game or a concert or the election? Or is it something more serious to get your attention? Like being surprised with divorce papers or finding out that your child was arrested or has an addiction issue or losing your job. You know what always gets our attention? Death. I mean, you can't ignore it. It's, it always interrupts our lives. It's never convenient. Uh, and today, Jesus wants our attention. 
He wants our attention. So he told a story about two dead guys. And what's interesting is he told the story to a bunch of wealthy religious leaders who ticked him off. Now, uh, before we get to the text, which is verse 19, I want you to look back at verse 14 of Luke chapter 16. And it says, The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed Jesus. And Jesus said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Now, Jesus had just told stories, a parable, about people handling money and doing a poor job of it and doing a good job of it. And uh, the Pharisees didn't like that. And so they were ridiculing Jesus. And, and so they didn't appreciate Jesus' teaching on money. So Jesus tells this parable beginning in verse 19. You may have heard it or it may be new to you, but it's really kind of a different story from what he usually tells. Jesus said, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And then the rich man said, Then I beg you, Father Abraham, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Now, this is a shocking story. It may not be shocking to you because maybe you've heard it before. But this is a story full of truths that we need to hear. And Jesus wants our attention. Now, the shocking part is that the Pharisees and pretty much all of Israel at the time believed that wealth was a sign of God's favor. They believed that if you were rich, then God was blessing you. And if you were poor, God was cursing you or judging you or punishing you. And and if you were healthy, then you were blessed by God. And if you were sick or crippled, then you were cursed by God. And so to them, when when Jesus tells this story, it's not mostly about a rich man, poor man. It's about a blessed man and a cursed man. And the Pharisees thought that the rich guy was the one who was the good guy that was blessed by God. And Lazarus, this poor guy, he was the bad guy who would end up in hell. And Jesus flips the script on them. He surprised them and maybe he surprises you. First of all, we see this as a picture of life. It's just a picture of life, right? Two men living very different lives. One is wealthy, privileged, comfortable, and selfish. The other is poor, disabled, begging, and helpless. So, which one do you relate to? I mean, every time you read a story in Scripture that Jesus tells, there's somebody that you relate to and somebody that you sit back and go, oh, that guy's bad, or that guy's good. See, it's easy and it's tempting to read Scripture and be angry at that selfish rich man. Can you believe he did that? And the reason is we never see ourselves as selfish or wealthy. We just don't, right? I mean, we're barely getting by. Inflation is killing us. Our house is small. Only have one RV garage. Car is old. Some people call it a classic. Uh, We're living on a fixed income and life is difficult. See, the problem is this. All of us are wealthy. All of us are wealthy. 
We live in the United States of America. And if some of our Canadians are here early, Canada. Both very wealthy countries. Okay? We have more comfort, freedom, possessions, and wealth than most of the world. Did you know that if you live at the U.S. government's declaration of extreme poverty in the United States of America, that you make more money than half the world does? Extreme poverty in the U.S. is middle class everywhere else. That's reality. The U.S. median household income is $68,000 a year. You want to guess what the world's household median income is? It's under ten thousand dollars a year. Now we're seven times richer than the rest of the world. Fifty percent of the world's families live on less than two thousand dollars a year. I mean, we never see ourselves as wealthy because we always know somebody who has more than us. But the question isn't whether we see ourselves as wealthy. The question is, does God and if you just look at the statistics of the world, then I think we've got to kind of listen to what happens to the rich guy because I think God looks at us and sees wealth. So uh, maybe look at your neighbor right now and smile when you say this and just go, hey, you're filthy rich. <laughs> Some of you stopped at just filthy. <laughs> you got you to finish the phrase. Now, for the purpose of hearing Jesus, maybe we should listen from the perspective of the nameless rich guy in the story. Just, uh, that's, that's a heads up. So two men living very different lives, then both of them die. By the way, we should be able to relate to that because it is appointed unto man once to die and then to face judgment. That's Hebrews chapter 9. So death is inevitable, and I know some of you have been holding out for a lifetime that Jesus is going to come again before you uh, have to taste death. But for most of us in this room, uh, and a lot of us tuning in, the odds are not in our favor any longer. So um, we got to go ahead and get comfortable with this idea that, that it's going to happen so we can and should be ready for that day. See, we don't know when we're going to die, but we are certain that we will. And since we know this, and I'm assuming you love your families... Uh, two thoughts unrelated to this story, life insurance and estate planning. You should do that. But first of all in the story, we see a picture of life, and then we see a picture of eternal life and eternal death. A picture of eternal life and death. So Lazarus dies, and he joins Abraham, who is the father of the faithful. Okay? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's what the Apostle Paul said. He's listed in the Hebrews 11 chapter of the heroes of faith. Uh, you know, he is the father of Israel. And so he represents all those who are faithful to God. And the poor cursed guy in the Pharisees' world ends up in heaven, or in the bosom of Abraham. The rich guy, the one who's supposed to be blessed by God, ends up in Hades in the place of torment and suffering. And this is a picture of heaven and hell. Now, it's not meant to tell us what heaven and hell is like. It's not telling us that there's conversations that happen between the two sides. It, it, he, Jesus is really just trying to tell us that eternity is real. Eternity is real. Once to die and then judgment. You're either going to have life and joy or you're going to have pain and suffering. Now, one of the popular myths right now in America is that you're going to get heaven or nihilism. Heaven or just cease to exist. There's a lot of people who kind of favor that because they don't want to have to deal with the concept of hell and a place of eternal pain and suffering and torment. But if you believe in Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you should probably get comfortable with the idea of hell because Jesus talks about it a lot. And we may not be comfortable with it, but it's still a reality. And Jesus is telling us, look, this is real. This is a truth that for everyone who dies without Jesus, their eternal reality is pain and sorrow. Eternity is real and eternity is permanent. There's no way back and forth. You can't cross over in either direction. You know what that means? It means the choices that we make in this life have eternal consequences. 
they have eternal consequences. Like every decision you make has consequences. You're going to reap what you sow. And, and the reality is in your relationship with Jesus, it has an eternal consequence that is in the most serious of all. This is why our mission at Calvary is so important. It's why we talk about leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus constantly because we know that eternity is permanent. And we want to see people come to life and meet Jesus and discover that he can change anyone and rescue any story. So eternity is real and permanent. But one thing Jesus doesn't tell in the story is how you get to heaven. So we have to listen to Jesus talk about heaven in other places, talk about salvation in other places. So in Luke 5, Jesus just simply says, follow me. That's why we don't use the word Christian a whole lot around here because everybody considers himself a Christian. I, I want you to follow Jesus because Jesus said, follow me. So I won't ask you, are you a Christian? I will ask you, are you following Jesus? And, and uh, Luke 9, 27, Jesus gets a little more specific because he says, if any of you is going to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and come follow me. In other words, this isn't an easy following. This is a choice to surrender to Jesus and give up control of your life and actually practice self-denial. In John chapter 3, some of this you've heard, some of this maybe you haven't, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Listen to this. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And then, of course, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, eternal life is not based on economic status, on your lineage or your heritage. It's not built on your religious activity or good deeds. Eternal life is found only by surrendering to and confessing Jesus as Lord. That's what we call a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So given this reality for salvation, in the midst of this story, we hear a request to warn. A request to warn. Lazarus, uh, not Lazarus, the rich guy asked Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his brothers. Please send him to tell my, you know, warn my brothers. I don't want my brothers. It's nice of this guy that he cared about his family, right? He wanted his family to escape the pain of hell. And so he says, send Lazarus. And, and Abraham says, look, they got Moses. They got the prophets. They should listen to them. He says, no, but they need, if they saw someone from the dead, then they would believe. And Jesus in the story says what? Even if one rises from the dead, they're not going to believe. Do you realize Jesus was prophesying in that moment what they were going to do when he rose from the dead? He's talking about himself in that moment. Now, you may not have connected the dots in the story, but... Um, you know, they, they didn't believe Moses and the prophets. Uh, the, the, let me put this way. The religious leaders that were ridiculing Jesus weren't listening to Moses and the prophets or else they would have been ready for Jesus the, as the Messiah. But they were pushing away God in the flesh, Jesus, and, and ridiculing him and trying to figure out how to kill him because they weren't listening to Moses and the prophets. And what happened when Jesus rose from the dead. Well, Matthew 28 tells the story of the guards going and reporting to Jesus, the angels appearing, the stone moving away, Jesus' body being gone, and the chief priests paid them hush money and told them to lie that the disciples came and stole the body. The chief priests, the people who were supposed to be in charge of the religion of the nation, are told that this guy who claimed to be the son of God was raised from the dead and they don't care. They don't care. And so they cover it up. Um, see, we can present truth. 
We can love people. We can model a Jesus character life, but we cannot convince anyone to follow Jesus. You and I can't convince anyone. You can't bribe anyone. You can't, you know, uh, just argue anyone into the kingdom. If they don't believe the truth, even the miraculous isn't going to convince them. You, you might think, well, if you, just, if you just talk to my preacher, that never works. <laughs> just telling you, it really doesn't. Well, if you could just, you know, hear this music group. Now, if you could just come to our church and worship. Now, look, if, if they don't want to receive Jesus, there's nothing you can do to convince them of that. Even the miraculous. Now, at the same time, we are absolutely responsible to live for Jesus, to love like Jesus, to serve like Jesus, but we're not responsible for the choices that other people make. Now, this is a wild story, and it's already been a wild, but how can it make a difference in our lives? So let's talk about applications to life. And, and by the way, these are incredibly obvious if you just pay attention to the story. So allow me to state the obvious to you, and you see it there, but these are the applications that all of us need to wrestle with as we consider this, this passage of Scripture. The first one is really obvious. Don't live selfishly. Don't live a selfish life. I mean, it's kind of obvious because the rich guy was the bad guy, right? But here's the thing. He wasn't the bad guy because he was wealthy. That wasn't the reason he was a bad guy. He was a bad guy because he was selfish. Scripture doesn't condemn having money it condemns being stingy with money. So be grateful and be generous. Be grateful. Generosity starts with gratitude. you guys know that? If you are thankful for the things you have instead of complaining about the things you don't have, it makes a huge difference in your life. Now, a little while ago, you guys laughed at a picture of me receiving a chicken. But do you realize the most precious gift a subsistence farmer can give you is food? And a chicken is valuable because they don't get much meat. And it's a chicken that none of us would want to eat because it's tougher than the worst steak you ever had at Sizzler. <laughs> but, uh, but they were grateful for what Calvary has done for them what God has done for them through Calvary. And, and so open your eyes and thank God for your blessings. They're all around you. You just have to start naming them and seeing them. And, and here's the thing, you gotta practice gratitude until praise and thanksgiving are the norm coming out of your mouth. So be grateful and be generous. Look, it's okay to have money. Scripture doesn't condemn that but it challenges us to share and invest it in God's kingdom. 1 Timothy chapter 6, the Apostle Paul is writing his, his uh, letter to Timothy, and he says, As for the rich in this present age, we've already established, that's us, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, that means stock market, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Look, God wants us to enjoy what we have. I mean, they're gifts from him. We are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. It's 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. You may want to mark that down and read it later. See, here's the question. Are you being generous? You know, I already told you, I just got back from Africa and, and you guys have been generous and 65 to 70,000 people a day are, are enjoying clean, fresh water because of what you're doing. And they're doing an amazing job putting those in. Okay, that, that, that's an amazing thing. But I get asked all the time, people say, well, how much does a well cost to sponsor? And the answer has been $3,000. Of course, now with inflation, it's probably going to be like 3500 per well. So if you do the math, Calvary's given a lot to the wells. And the team over there has done great stewardship because they've gotten more wells than one per $3,000. Uh, so that's a win. And if you want to donate to wells, that's, I'm just telling you that. So you, that you may, if you're inspired, great. Also, we got a campus in Parker, praise God, and it is doing great. 
And uh, we were given a building, but it was built in the 1950s and 60s, and so it needs a lot of work remodeling, and that's going to cost us a little over a million dollars. Now, the good news is we've got over half of that already raised. So praise God. But that means we need about $500,000 more. And if you're really feeling generous, that's a five with five zeros after it, <laughs> as long as it clears the bank. Okay? But it's a great investment, not just in the campus in Parker, but in eternity. You see, the lesson is we got to be grateful and we got to be generous. So don't live selfishly. And then another application to our life is be prepared for eternity. I mean, we already mentioned that we're all going to die and we're all going to face judgment. So the question is, do you want to go to heaven? Yes. Good. There's a smattering here. The rest of you are like, no, I'd rather go to Pizza Hut. Um, look, do you want to go to heaven? Yes. Okay, well, if you want to go to heaven, then you have to surrender to Jesus. You have to confess Jesus as Lord and, and, and follow him. Now, if you haven't done that, or if as everybody was shouting yes, you went, you're, you're saying really to yourself, I don't know, then we want to talk with you about that. See, we exist as a church to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And we want you to have a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And if you haven't experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus, we want to talk with you about that. We'd love for you to make that decision tonight, but if you're not ready tonight, that's fine because there's always tomorrow and there's always this next week, at least if you stay alive. And, and so we want to have that conversation with you when you're ready to have it. You can do that a lot of ways. I mean, pastors will be available after the service. Our prayer team is going to be right here at the front. They would love to talk with you about Jesus. You can grab one of those Connect cards and fill it out and just say, hey, I want to talk to somebody about Jesus. We'll get in touch with you this week. We will talk with you about how to have that life-changing relationship with Jesus. We just don't want anyone to be unprepared for that moment of judgment when you stand and give an account before God because if you surrender to Jesus, then your name's going to be written in the book of life and you're going to end up in that place that is described as there with Abraham among the faithful. So we plead with you. I, I don't mind begging. I want you to be prepared. I don't want you to wonder. I don't want you to, to be afraid. I don't want you to, to think that you're just going to take your chances. I want you to know that you have moved from death to life. And then finally, application is warn those you love while you can. Warn those you love while you can. Hell is real. It's a place of torment and pain. It is not a party with your friends. It, you know, uh, look, a lot of our popular culture likes to play it down. Like, oh, it's not all that serious. We're just going to have a great time with our friends in hell because we can't go to heaven. Heaven's for boring people anyway. That is like the dumbest idea ever. You know, I, I could describe it how horrible that thinking is, but I, I think you get that. But the, the problem is a lot of us have dismissed that idea of hell and we're thinking, well, maybe it's just nothing. And Jesus says it is something. So look, you have influence. Every person in this room has influence. You have influence with family, you have influence with friends, coworkers, people in your life who respect you and trust you. That's why it's not a big deal to introduce them to your pastor. They don't know me, they don't trust me, they don't respect me. But they know you. And if they trust and respect you, then you have the power to influence them for the kingdom of God. So what are you doing to lead your friends, your family to a life-changing relationship with Jesus? I don't want you to miss this opportunity. I mean, invite them to attend with you. And, and I'm all for bribery. Tell them you'll buy them dinner afterwards if it's Saturday night. Tell them to take them to lunch if it's Sunday. Breakfast before church, brunch, oh, whatever. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, if they won't come with you, write a letter. I know no one writes letters anymore, but take your phone out and record your story of how Jesus changed your life and then send it to them. You can do that. You know, some of you are good at taking selfies. How about making a little video? <laughs> For something that matters. Parents, please make your child's spiritual life a priority at least on the level of their education and athletics. I mean, have them in church, bring them to youth groups, send them to camps and on mission trips. 
And please, most importantly, parents, model an authentic Christian life. A life of faith and a life following Jesus. That's going to influence your kids more than anything else. Grandparents, I know you're praying for your grandkids. Pray for them more. But also this. If their parents are struggling financially or don't want to make that commitment to put the money down for camp or a mission trip, why don't you stand in the gap? Why don't you invest in your grandkids in a way that could have eternal dividends? Don't, don't let money keep them from, from being in a place where, where God wants to change their life. And please, grandparents, tell your grandkids the story of how Jesus changed your life. Don't just go, well, you know, my grandparents are good people and they went to church. No, let them know that it wasn't being a good person and going to church, but it was Jesus Christ's death and resurrection and you surrendering to him. That's what made a difference in your life. And that's what you want them to know. You see, let's take this seriously because it's a matter of life and death and eternity. That's what we can learn from two dead guys. Will you pray with me? Father, we love you. Your love for us is amazing. It is wonderful. It's incredible. It's really beyond our comprehension, but we thank you for that reality that in Christ we have hope, we have life, we have forgiveness. We have a future that is, that is full of joy and life beyond anything we've ever experienced. So God, meet us in this place. And lead us to a point of repentance for our casual approach to our friends that don't know you, our family that ignores you, for our casual commitment uh, to our family's spiritual life. And God, help us to surrender to you, to follow you without hesitation, without qualification, just completely and totally saying yes to Jesus because you're the only one who can save us. So Lord, speak to us, because we're listening. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.